And one of the questions that I get is oftentimes before I get it, really when it's almost too late, Pastor, is there any possible way that we can salvage our broken marriage? Pastor, can we salvage our broken marriage? And so I want to talk about that today. You say, why Why wedding pictures? Because I want to bring you today face-to-face with your wedding. I, I want to bring you back. I want to bring you back to that wedding day. How many of you know that uh, there are very, very, very few divorces that have ever, ever happened on the wedding day? I mean, I'm sure it's happened before. I'm sure there's someone in Hollywood that's had it in the old. I, I'm sure it's happened, but it's very, very rare. How many of you know that there are very, very, very few divorces during the honeymoon? No, 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 there ain't no divorces. There's some hot passion. Come on, somebody, amen? There's some sugaring going on. Matter of fact, some of y'all submitted some pictures. One, a couple of y'all had your wife's lips sucked down. I mean, it was, come on. I mean, did y'all see Josh? Like, where did Amber's lips go? No, you know, when, you're, when you first get married, everything is passionate. Everything is exciting. Everything is exhilarating. I mean, everything is, is just uh, overjoyed, and you're like, wow, I can't believe that she married me. I want to bring you back. Somebody say back. I want to bring you back to your wedding day and to those times in your life. Now, I want to share with you a passage of Scripture today that, that you probably never heard used in a sermon or a teaching on marriage, and that's Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. You say, wait a minute, time, time out, Pastor. That's about marriage? Well, not really, but it is about our marriage, our marriage to the Lord. Our marriage to the Lord. The Bible says that we, you and I, those of us that know Christ, we are the bride of Christ. We are the bride. If we're the bride, he's the groom, right? We are the bride of Christ. Let's look at it together. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the churches at Ephesus, write this. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this. I know your deeds and your labor and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have put those who call themselves apostles to the test. They are not and they are not, and you found them to be false. Man, he is bragging on them. Look in verse 3. And you have perseverance and have endured on account of my name and have not become weary, but I have this against you. Uh Uh-oh. You see, he's bragging on them, and now he's coming back, and he said, whoa, but, but I got something against you. What is it? You have left your first love. The passion, the passion that you once had for me, the passion that was in your relationship with me is not there anymore. You're kind of going through the motions. You look okay from the outside, but things are not right on the inside. Therefore, remember, Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Repeat, or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, this passage of Scripture specifically for those Christians who have, uh, who have left or lost their passion for the Lord. They've left their first love. And I want to suggest to you today that we can use this passage without getting outside of what God would have for us. I believe we can use the same things that God tells us in verse 5. We can use these same words to apply to our marriages today because so many marriages, watch this, they look okay from the outside. You know, we're pretty good at putting up a facade. We're pretty good at hiding stuff. I mean, let's look again. Put that passage back up there again, if you will. And and look in verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, back up to verse 2. Verses 2 and 3, the Bible says in verse 2, and I I know your deeds and your labor and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil people and you have those who have called themselves apostles and are not and they are not and you have found them to be liars. Look in verse 3. And you have perseverance and have endured on on the account of my name and have not become weary. 
What is he saying? Man, you look good on the outside. Ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you today that we have marriages in our church and marriages in our city and marriages around the world that on the outside, everything looks hunky-dory. Everything looks like it is okay. Because that's what we do, right? Because we don't want anybody to know that we might be going through some stuff. Can I, can I just hear you? Listen, friend, we all are going to go through some stuff in life. We need to get over that pride that we have. We, I'm telling you, every single married couple is going to go through some periods of time in their marriage relationship where they're going through some stuff. But we try to hide it. And we look good on the outside, outside, but then he says, then he says, but I got something against you. You've left your first love. You see, you may look like everything is good on the outside, but when you walk on the inside of the house, oh, daddy's sleeping on the couch. Hello. I know it's not far from the midnight snack in the kitchen, but it's not good. I'd rather snack on some sugar, hey man. Hello, hello, hello. I'm sorry, I'm getting too real. Sorry, 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 I forgot. It looks good on the outside, but on the inside there's pain. On the inside there's turmoil. On the inside of the home there's, oh, it's okay with the kids, but when it comes to mom and dad, the passion, the fire that was once lit, the fire that was there during dating, the fire that was there during the engagement, the fire, the passion during the wedding day, and oh, on the honeymoon. Listen, friend, something has happened. Life has interfered, and now you don't even sleep in the same room. I believe we can take this passage of Scripture and we can apply the same things that we apply to falling out of love with Jesus. Can I say to you, listen to me, everybody lean in. Love is a choice. You choose to love or you choose not to. Now what does he say in verse 5? He says three words, remember, repent, and return or repeat. Remember, repent, and repeat or return to those things that you did before. Here's the formula for coming back to first love. Here, here is the formula for your marriage. Here is the formula for coming back to passion. Here is the formula for coming back to that, that, that relationship that was red hot on fire. But somebody poured some cold ice water on it. So let's look at it together. Write these three words down. I just gave you the outline. It's really simple today. Number one, remember. What I want to do is I want to bring you back. I want to bring you back. I want to bring you back. What does it say in verse 5? He says, remember, therefore remember, remember. Somebody say, remember. I want you to go back, and I just want you to take a moment. You say, some of you, uh, some of you go, oh, I don't want to do that. Why? Why not? Because it will bring you back to a time when you were in love. You remember, 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 remember when she, she caught your eye. Remember, remember where you were. Remember when, when he called your eye. Remember, re I never will forget. Man, I've always been this real romantic guy. Guess where it was? Shoney's. The best breakfast bar in America. Somebody open Shoney's back up. Somebody open it up and manage it right. I mean, I was, yeah, strawberry cake. Somebody talk about some strawberry cake. Some hot fudge sundae, some breakfast bar with some melted cheese to pour over your eggs, and some sauteed mushrooms, and some French toast. Come on, somebody. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong message. Passionate, not about food. <laughs> All right, TMI. I don't even know what you say, but I'm probably, I'm not sure. Remember, remember, remember. All I know, I was minding my own business, eating some chicken strips and french fries and, and, and a salad with a whole bunch of, y'all remember the Thousand Island dressing? This is before the days of ranch. You could eat their Thousand Island with a fork. So thick. Man, okay, anyway. So I'm minding my own business, eating like I always do, hardly ever even look up. 
Never look up. But for some reason, I, something, something caught my eye. It wasn't a something. It was a somebody with a blue jean dress on. Hello, somebody. Now, I know you ain't supposed to look twice, but I. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You remember when you first saw her, guys? Come on, man. You remember when you first saw her, you're like. <laughs> Remember when she caught your eye? Remember that first date? That first date, Tammy, Tammy and I, well, her dad was, uh, wasn't sure about me. So he let us, first of all, go to this little Pentecostal church in Milan, Tennessee, Brother Groves. Some of you know what I'm talking about, Brother Groves. I think he may still be there in pastor. I don't know, Brother Groves. And they had, a, they had a thing on the Halloween, you know, they had this judgment house. And I'm in there like, Ooh, you know. Good up close to my woman. No, I think my father-in-law was there. I didn't get too close. But anyway, my first date. But that wasn't really our first date. He let us go to the ch- to church. That's a good place to go for our first date, by the way. Our first date. That's right. I wind and dined her, baby. Put my Wrangler jeans on. No, I think I was wearing parachute pants back in the day. How many of y'all remember parachute pants? Had my parachute pants on. I was skinny. I said, I'm going to carry you out to the nicest restaurant in Jackson, Tennessee. Friday night, all you can eat, seafood buffet. Old country store, baby! I thought that was the place. I didn't know. I was stupid and dumb. $12.99 back in the day. She ate two shrimp. I'm like, oh. But I remember, I remember, I never will forget the, remember, remember, remember back when you called, remember that first day, remember when your heart was pounding out of your chest when you saw her, guys, remember, 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 ladies, when it took you two hours to put your makeup on, because you put it on, and you didn't like it, and you took your little baby wipe thing, and you took it off, and you put it on again, and you didn't like it, and you took it off, and you put it on again. Why? Because you were going out on a date with your man. <laughs> now some of you don't even wear makeup. Hello, somebody. Remember! Friend, remember, 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 remember those Friday nights. You remember those Friday nights when you were dating? You couldn't wait to get all spruced up and you got your, your, your best clothes on, you know, your, and, your, and, and, and guys, you actually wore deodorant. And you put some cologne on. You remember back in the day it was polo. Put your polo on, and you, and you carried her out to this nice restaurant. It was a Friday night. I remember I was working uh, at two different places. I was working at Heilig Myers Furniture Company. You might remember that place. It was a finance company, what it was. Anyway, so that's where I worked. I was the warehouse. I worked in the warehouse. I delivered furniture. I promoted up to the warehouse manager, but I still didn't make squat. And then I got this job at H&W Electronics. Woody Holloway, he hired me. I paid for that. I bought that job. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Back in the day, there was, a, there was this uh, job service. You could pay them to get a good job. He hired me to be a salesperson. I thought, all right, I'll get to wear, wear some nice clothes. I'm going to sell some car stereos, some subwoofers, some amps, you know. Would he let me work out there about two days? Then he put me back in the bag and said, I got to teach you how to put a stereo in. I wasn't good at that either. And so I didn't make much money. But I remember when Friday night came around, oh, my wife, my, my girlfriend, she wanted to go out and eat. She still wants to go out and eat. She won't go out and eat. And I spent every penny I had on her. Friday night's out, man. It was so much fun. And remember the, the engagement time? I'm just bringing you back. Because I want you to understand and remember, there was once a time when that person that you're married to, that you're bitter towards, that you don't like, that you've chosen not to love because he got on your nerves or she got on your nerves or because something has come between y'all, there was once a time, there was once a time that y'all kissed. There was once a time when y'all put your arms around each other and hugged each other. 
There was once a time where you actually sat next to each other on the couch and smooched while you was watching a movie. There was once a time when you slept in the same bed. There was once a time you were passionate in love with that person. Remember the engagement? You were counting down the days till you stood in front of all them people. And you said, I do. I do. Remember the engagement? Wow. Remember the wedding day? How many of y'all remember the wedding day? Wedding day? I've done so many weddings lately. I've gone. I, I, here at this church, I do more weddings and less funerals, but in the other churches, I did more funerals and less weddings. But we got a bunch of people that like to get married around here, and I love it. And I've done a lot of weddings, and man, it never fails. It never fails when you're standing there. That's the pastor. You're just there because you got to be there. You know, nobody really wants you there. You're just there, you know. you got to have a pastor to do this thing, right? And so I'm kind of there, and I like take one picture. Pastor, we won't get one picture with you. Adios, I'm gone. Darren, you know how it is, brother. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. I don't know if you've been there or not. You were there with me, one or two of them. But anyway, so, so you're standing there as the pastor, and the groom is here, and all of a sudden, here she comes. Walking down the stairs or walking down the aisle. We just did one with Josh and Anna. In the rain. In the rain. Here comes little Anna. She had a little hat on. And I'm telling you, when she came, started walking down them steps, and I was praying the whole time, please, Lord Jesus, don't let her fall. <laughs> Josh's eyes are this big. That big. Why? Oh, the love. Oh, the passion. Remember that day. Come on, somebody, you remember that day? That day, and then not only the wedding day, but then the honeymoon. If you ain't thinking what I'm thinking, you're not as normal as God intends you to be. Amen? Amen? God made us to want sugar. You remember that day? Come on, you remember, you remember when you got in the car and all the events and all this, all the celebration and you know, all the stuff, you don't you know taking the thing off her leg and you chunked it back here and somebody ran up and took it and then you're like, okay, I'm out of here. And you get in your car and they paint something on your window, just married, and then you take off to your honeymoon. I never forget, romantic again. We go to the holiday inn. In Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. No, it was Gatlinburg, wasn't it? Didn't matter. We had a door, a door with a bow lock on it. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Come on, remember. If you remember, say, I remember. I'm just telling you, friend, there was a time, there was a time, there was a time, those of you watching, there was a time when you loved that man, there was a time when you loved that woman, there was a time that you laid down your life for your spouse. There was a time. Remember, 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 remember. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know there's very few, if ever any, divorces during the honeymoon? Why? There's passion. There's excitement. There's energy. There's sugar. Have I said that already? The second word is the word repent. Verse 5. I'm sorry. I'm scaring some of you that are first-timers today. This is just who we are. We like sugar. Amen. Only with our own spouse. We'll get to you if you like it with other spouse. Then we're going to get to you in a minute. But see, 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 the church at Ephesus, they were going through the motions. Everything looked good on the outside. But man, on the inside, they, were, they lost their joy. They lost their passion. They lost that first love. It also happens in marriages. If we're not careful and we don't work on our marriage, listen, friend, you are saved by grace, but if you're going to grow in your faith, you've got to work at it. You've got to be disciplined at it. You've got to do some. You've got to get up in the morning and read your Bible even when you don't feel like You've got to spend time in prayer. You've got to be at church. You've got to come to the house of God. I thank God for all of you that watch online, but there ain't nothing like being here. 
I mean, listen, if you want to grow in your faith, you got to live a life of commitment, a life of generosity. And these are the things, these are the things that you got to do. You don't work to keep your salvation, but you work to make your, your relationship with Jesus even closer and closer and closer. It's the same way with your marriage. Thank God for that one day of grace when she says, okay, I'll marry you. Hallelujah. But then, if you want to keep your marriage strong and vibrant and passionate, you got to work at it. You got to work at it. So I want to talk about the word repent. What does that mean? Repent. Well, repentance basically means change. It means change. So how do we change? Number one, write this down. Number one, if your marriage is not what it needs to be, if your I'm not talking about, listen, there's nobody's got a perfect marriage, but if your marriage is not what it needs to be, if your marriage is far from what it needs to be, number one, you need to just go ahead and admit that. Man, I talk to a lot of people, man, because a lot of you have come out of addiction backgrounds. Matter of fact, we live in a day-to-day where almost everybody's had some type of addiction in their life. We live in that kind of day today, and they'll tell you in the addiction uh, life, uh, lifestyle that the very first thing you've got to do before you can get help is what? Admit it. And we want to walk around in our marriages acting like everything is wonderful. There's sometimes when it's not wonderful. We got to quit sweeping it under the rug. Well, I'm gonna keep sweeping it under the rug. Well, guess what? You're never gonna you're never gonna get any help. It's never gonna get any better until you get out from under the rug. You can't just quit, uh, keep sweeping it under the rug. Nothing will ever change until you admit to yourself and your spouse, "Hey, we got some issues." We got some problems. We got some stuff we got to deal with. Matter of fact, in your spiritual life, 1 John 1, 9, he says, if you you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But the very first thing you got to do is you got to confess to God, hey, God, here I am. I messed up. That's the first thing you got to do. In your marriage relationship, listen to me, people. In your marriage relationship, you've got to come to the place where you say, hey, our marriage is not what it needs to be. It's a far cry from what it used to be, and we don't want to live this way. Because if you don't deal with it, what's going to happen? It's going to continue to fester and get worse and worse. Listen to me, and get worse and worse until you are bitter towards your spouse. And when you let yourself get bitter and anger begins to enter in, that anger turns to bitterness and hatred and you can't stand the the ground that your spouse walks on. Listen, friend, when you get that point, the only thing that can help it is Jesus. You see, we walk in, oh, hey, little Johnny, I love you, little dude. Hey, little Susie, oh, Susie, you did good. And then you walk by your man, and you just. Speak to the hand, face ain't home. Leave a message after the tone. (laughs) Sorry, I went back to the 90s for a minute. You know what I'm saying? It's worth saving. But you got to admit it. Number two, you got to address it. You've got to address it. Often it, it, it happens because of a spiritual problem in our own lives. A spiritual problem. We got to address that spiritual problem first. I want you to listen closely. Listen to me. Jesus does not need to be your co pilot, Jesus must be your pilot. You must build your relationship, number one, on a firm foundation. What's the firm foundation? The firm foundation is the petrol rock, the solid rock, the cornerstone is Jesus himself. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll never have a marriage that honors and glorifies God if you both don't, first of all, know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've got to be equally yoked. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequal, unequally yoked with unbelievers. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to make sure if you're here and you're not married yet and you're dating and you're in that dating scene and you pray, oh, God, send me somebody. Don't just pray somebody that God will send you somebody. Pray that God will send you the right body. A man that knows Jesus. Well, he says he does. 
He says he, he says he does. You make sure he's a born-again child of God that's going to lead your relationship. First of all, let me tell you, if you're here today and you've never been saved, listen to me. Listen to me, sir. Listen to me, ma'am. Before you go into a marriage relationship, give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. But then if you're in a relationship and you're not right with God as a child of God, get right with God. That helps everything. Secondly, you need to quit doing what you're doing that's causing all the pain and the distrust in the relationship. Hello? Just quit doing what you're doing. It's called repentance. Quit doing what you're doing that's causing all the pain. Put your spouse before you put yourself. Put your spouse before you put yourself. Put your, come on, I need to get a rap going. Put your spouse before. Amen? Put your spouse before you put yourself. I mean, you, you've got to quit doing what you're doing. <laughs> Look, I, I, y'all know I'm not much of a counselor, but I'll tell you what the Bible says. I, had, I was pastoring one church. I won't name, I'll change the names, uh, but uh, we're live, I think. Um, so I'll change the name, but I, I never will forget I was at home at the, we lived in a, uh, uh, never mind, I'm giving it away. We lived in this house next to the church. I just gave it away. But anyway, we lived in this house. I get a phone call, and he said, hey, pastor, pastor, can we come over? We got some serious stuff going on. It was late at night. I said, yeah, just meet me at the church. I don't have an office. My office was in the house. And they, I said, just meet me in the worship center. And I turn all the lights on, and, and within 10 minutes, there they are pulling up. And uh, I, I sit in this old wood space pew, and uh, they were sitting behind me, had my arm up on the thing, and I said, okay, what's up, what's up, what's up, because I didn't think anything, I sure didn't think what, was, what she was about to say was really why they were coming, and she said, she said, Pastor, Rufus has got a girlfriend. What? I started laughing in her face. I'm a terrible pastor. I, didn't, I thought she was cold. Rufus got a girlfriend. And then she started crying. I'm like, oh, no, I just ruined that. Rufus got a girlfriend. So I looked back at Rufus, and I said, Rufus, you got a girlfriend? He said, yeah, I do. I said, well, get out of bed with your girlfriend and get back in bed with your wife and kiss on her and stop kissing on the woman that ain't your wife. Hello, Amen. Okay, you're not getting it. Okay, so I should have been more clear. Hey, Rufus, you got a girl? Yeah, I got a, yeah, I got a girlfriend. Quit leaving your house, going to her house, smooching on somebody that ain't your wife because the Bible calls that adultery. The Bible calls that sin. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just throwing this in there for any of you. You're not supposed to have sex with anybody but your own wife. Hello, somebody. That's all you want to tell me, Pat? That's it? I mean, we need to make sure it's not a spiritual problem. We need to quit doing what we're doing that's causing pain and, and dis destruction in our, and distrust in our relationship. And then we need to seek help. Seek help. Seek help. Don't wait till the bitterness that we talked about earlier creeps in. Here's the problem. We don't want anybody to know that we're having marriage issues. And you sure don't want the pastor to know for whatever reason. I hope that, I hope that we can take all this pastor stuff off and, and, and this relationship between uh, pastor and people and just know that I love you and that we're going to talk real and we want the best for you. I want you to just take all that stuff, take the pride and strip it away. Don't be that person that says, hey, hey, we can't tell the pastor. We can't tell the pastor we're having marriage. Why not? You want some help, don't you? But people don't come to me until, man, it's so far gone. Ain't much I can do. I mean, you, you, you're ready to attack each other with a sledgehammer by the time you come see me. You know what I'm saying? Don't wait till the marriage is almost ready to implode or explode. 
Seek help. That's the reason. I want you to listen, and I want you to write this down. That's the reason that we, as a church, as one of our partners, outreach partners, we have a, we have a partnership with the Pratt Clinic. P, uh, not P.A. Pratt. He's my friend at going up. Wrong P.A., wrong Pratt. Pepper, he's preached here before. That's the reason we have a relationship, a partnership with Pepper Pratt and his clinic that if you are a soul quester, the church pays for your first two visits free. It don't cost you nothing. That's how much we, we, we value relationships in this church. We want you to succeed. We want, listen, we want your relationship not to just survive, not to just get by, but to thrive. We want you to get sugar every day. God does too. That's weird, Pastor. No, it's not. Ring, read the song of Solomon. Then people got sugar every day. We want you to succeed. That's the reason we offer this. We offer this. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Ask for help. Ask for help. Man, we will get you plugged in. I'll, ladies, your husband messing around, come see me. I'll tell him a thing or two. I've done it many times. After he punches me in the face, we'll get back up and I'll say it again. But better than that, we'll send you, get you hooked up with Christian counseling to help you in your relationship. Listen, we have sent dozens of couples from this church to the Pratt Clinic, and they have been helped. So many have been helped. But you got to ask for help. Seek help. So here, here's the bottom line. i got to hurry. you got the word remember. Go back. Remember how it used to be. That's why we threw those pictures up on the screen. I want you to remember. And by the way, a lot of people, because they are on social media, saw what I was preaching on today, and they don't want to deal with it. So they didn't come. They didn't submit a picture. Most of you that submitted a picture, you're probably doing okay, pretty good. Maybe not. But I want to just encourage you today. Don't sit back and let it die. At one time, it was a good thing. God wants to restore it. The last thing that I want to share with you is the word repeat. What does he say in verse 5? Therefore, remember... From where you have fallen, repent and do the deeds you did at first. I'm making everything sugar. Sugar again. R repeat. Repeat. I, I entitled this message First Love. First Love is your broken marriage salvageable. First Love, because I wanted to bring you back to that love at the very beginning. That first love, that first love. So let me give you three things real quick in closing. Number one, first love is exciting. Remember how it was? It was exhilarating, exciting. Man, your friends were like, huh, Ronnie won't run around with me no more. No, she's prettier than you. Heck no, I'm going to hang out with her. Why? I'm excited about the relationship. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My son, I remember back a few years ago, Casher had just been born not long before that. They'd married. Casher got, uh, was born. And then Sarah had to go to Maryland. She's from Maryland, my daughter-in-law. She had to go back to Maryland for something. I don't remember what it was. Austin couldn't go. She had to leave that day. He couldn't leave that day. And so he was, like, really upset. You know, I can't go. And she, I'm sending her 15 hours away. And I think she drove by herself. And that was, like, a big deal. And and 15 hours away, and Austin was pretty in the dumps, and he got this bright idea. After he got done what he had to get done, he thought, I'm going to surprise her. He called John Lawrence. John, are you still in here? He called John Lawrence. John worked for the UPS, and I think he retired from UPS. And Austin said, hey, John, you got a, you know, my creative son. He said, John, you, Mr. John, you got an you old UPS uniform I can borrow? 
And he got this thing up in his mind. He's all excited. He's all, he just can't get it off his mind. He's excited. He's got this thing. He said, I'm going to put the UPS out. He said, this is so corny. No, this is love. It's exciting. It makes you do crazy stuff. He said, I'm going to put this UPS. I'm going to drive 15 hours one way. I'm going to have a package. I'm going to buy Sarah this nice gift. I'm going to knock on her mom and dad's door. She has no idea I'm coming. She's going to answer the door. I don't think she answered the door, by the way. But somebody in said, Sarah, somebody's here. You got a package. She said, I got a package. And she walks to the door, and there is my son in a UPS outfit, and he's giving her a box, and then he got some sugar. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, first love is exciting. Remember how excited it was when you went out on Friday night? Remember, do it again. Do it again. Somebody say it again. Do it again. Come on, say it again. Do it again. What was exciting at the beginning can still be exciting now. Do it again. You say, but pastor, I ain't got no money now. But pastor, I can't afford a babysitter. But pastor, I got kids at home. I can't leave them. I ain't got nobody to leave them with. That's the reason we got this graphic we shared with you earlier. Do we have it this time? We shared it earlier on October the 29th. Guess what we're offering here at the church? Again, parents' night out. It don't cost n -n 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 nothing. Drop your kid off at 6. Pick them up before 9. There it is. Pick them up before 9. It don't cost you nothing. Go out. You say, I ain't got no money. Go to McDonald's. Listen, you ain't got no money. We'll give. Darren said he will give you $30. Take the woman out to eat. First love is exciting. First love is expressive. Say it. Expressive. That word means engaging, accommodating, supportive of others, showing emotions. Most men were not, oh, I don't want to show no emotion. Why not? Just tell her you love her. Say it. Matter of fact, let's just practice it. On three, say I love you. One, two, three. Don't tell me. Tell your spouse. I know you love me. Say it out loud. One, two, three. I love you. Say it. She said, I don't mean it. We just got through a sermon series on the power of the tongue. There's, there's life and death in the, in, in, in the, in the power. Uh, uh, there's, in the power of the tongue, there's, there's life and death. Say it till you mean it. Just keep saying it. Keep saying it. I don't mean it. She got on my nerves. Say it anyway. I love you. I love. You. Matter of fact, here's your homework. Before the end of the day, say, tell you. You say, well, my spouse's not here. It don't matter. Well, tell her when you get home. Text her, call her if she's working, and she'll pass out on the floor. Pick her back up. Say it again. Honey, I love you. 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 First love is expressive. It's expressive. When's the last time? When's the last time you hugged your spouse? Hugged. Well, I'm not a hugger. You better be hugging on your spouse. I know you may be weird on the, in church. My son hugs like this. You like it too, aren't you, Darren? You don't like me hugging. Huh? You love to hug. Okay. Well, look, even if you don't like to hug, hug your spouse. Hug your spouse. When's the last time you hug? When's the last time you kiss? When's the last time you said, I love you? First love not last. First love is expensive. It costs, doesn't it? <laughs> we got time for me to tell one more story. I, when we lived in, I was pastoring in Trenton, and we lived out on the golf course. It's not there anymore. Out on between my island and Trenton on the highway, there was a golf course out there. We lived out in one of the houses, a rental house. We were building a house, one of the many houses we've lived in. Anyway, David, that's David, my son-in-law, lived out there. And so Madison and David were best friends growing up. They were just a little bitty. And Madison kept saying, Daddy, Daddy, I want a golf cart. Everybody out here has got a golf cart. I'm, we're living in the golf cart. We could barely afford the rent. And everybody got these nice, easy go, you know, $4,000 golf cart. I said, okay, uh, I'll see what I can do. And so we went, and our, uh, two houses down, three houses down, there was a man. He had an old, watch this, a three-wheeler, a three easy go, three-wheel golf. They don't sell them anymore. Why? Because they will kill you. 
And, and, and so I went down and I paid. I think I paid him $400 for that easy go. It was nasty. It was disgusting. It was dirty. It ran good, but it just was filthy. And Madison said, hey, Dad, la-. Dad, because she always wanted to do a project, and she's always doing something, you know. And she said, Dad, Dad, let's make this a daddy-daughter project. Daddy, let's get some masking tape, some painter's tape. We'll, we'll tape it up, and we'll paint it pink. So I got some oil-based oil pink paint. And we painted that thing, man. Everybody knew when Madison was coming because here she come down a hill. She would go 45 miles an hour. Up a hill, two and a half miles an hour. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just, it was old. It was old, it was old, 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 older than I am. It was really old. And I remember that she didn't have no time. The batteries went dead, and, and uh, they all played out. And so I went to the, the battery place over here on Airways, you know, where they, they sell golf carts or work on golf carts. And, and I bought batteries and wiring harnesses and you name it. It cost a fortune. She had it back for about a week and a half, and her and David and one other kid in the neighborhood were driving it down a hill. I'm sure it was David driving it because he tears up everything. They turned the steering wheel sharp, and when they did, it rolled. It tumbled, and all the batteries flew everywhere in the world and busted, and harnesses broke out. And I'm like, I brought it back, and they said, (laughs) they laughed at me. Brother, we got to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars to get this back. I said, forget it, just keep it. So then Madison decides to marry this guy. Matter of fact, he worked all night long, and he's here, all three services today. He's a good guy. But let me get back to my story because I'm running out of time. She married him. They weren't married no time, and she started talking about this golf cart. She said, oh, David, I sure wish I hadn't got rid of that thing. I love that. It was sentimental. I love that thing. David started, where is it? Brother Ronnie, he called me brother. Brother Ronnie, you know where it's at? You know where it's at? Well, I'm sure it's probably still there because they ain't nobody want it, and they ain't sell it to nobody. And so David and I went back to this place, and he said, I, I kind of vaguely remember that pink golf cart. I'm sure it's way back there. We've taken all the parts off of it and, and put them on other things, but it's way back there in the lot. If you can get to it, you can have it. You can have what's left of it. you got to pick it up, get it to your truck, haul it off, and give me $400. Well, David found it, and he bought it. You know why he did that? For a piece of trash. Because he loved Madison. Ladies and gentlemen, first love is expensive. It costs you. It costs you. Man, I I spent everything that I had on my wife when we were dating. Wait a minute. I still do. In a Dave Ramsey kind of way, Noah. First love is expensive. Let me close with this. I want you to see the example of first love. 1 John 4 and verse 19. Before you look at it, how can we love that spouse of ours that we've been distant from for a long time? How can we fall back in love again with our wife or a husband that we haven't slept with in five years? How... How can it ever be like it was on the screens? How can it ever be like it was the day when all that joy during the dating process, the engagement, the marriage, the honeymoon, how can we have that first love again? How? you got to choose to love again. Love is a choice. People say, well, I don't love her anymore. Well, you chose not to. I don't love him anymore. You chose not to. We love because he first loved us. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying so hard, so hard, that the capillaries under his skin burst and blood began to flow through his pores, he was saying, I love you. When he was brought through trial after trial after trial, and they took a cat of nine tails, and they beat Jesus on his, on his chest and his back 39 times, and, and every time they would hit him and blood would flow, Jesus was saying, I love you. 
When they took Jesus and they carried him up the, down the Via Della Rosa and they brought him up to Calvary and they took a mallet and spikes and drove the spikes into his hands and his feet. Every time the mallet hit the spike and went through his hands, Jesus said, I love you. I love you. We weren't very lovable, were we? We put him on the cross, but he chose to love us. Now, let me say this, because some of you are thinking, yeah, but my husband or my wife was unfaithful. Infidelity, adultery, pastor, adultery. Let me tell you this. I want you to listen. Everybody lean in. According to the Word of God, that is a grounds for divorce. But it's not a mandate for divorce. Listen to what I said. It's a grounds for divorce. If you get a divorce, and that's your decision, not mine, that's your decision. That's between you and God. If you choose, you are free because of his or her infidelity. It's grounds, but it's not a mandate. You get to choose to forgive and to move on or say no. It's your choice. I want you to make sure, I want you to understand that from the very get go. And others of you, I'm just throwing these things in there. And others of you, you've already gone through a divorce. And I want you to know there's no judgment coming from your pastor whatsoever. None. None. Listen to me. You've gone through a divorce. I thank God that there is life after divorce. Come on, amen? Thank God. Thank God. So what, have I, what I've said today, everyone can take it. If you've been married divorced, and you're single, and you think, man, I might like to get married again. Apply these in your life. If you've never been married, and you're single, and you want to be married, apply these things in your life. If you are married right now, and things aren't exactly what they need to be, apply these things in your life. If your marriage is great, great. You get sugar every day. Just keep applying these things in your life. Amen? Amen? Keep applying these things in your life. But the bottom line is, and I close, you will not have the marriage relationship that God wants you to have if you, first of all, both of you are not born again from on high. Must be that firm. Matter of fact, if you get married and you're not both saved, the Bible says you are unequally yoked together. There's no unity there. There's no unity in the spirit. But listen, friend, if both of you give your life to Christ and you build your marriage relationship on Jesus, not as your co-pilot, but as your pilot, the best is yet to come. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close. Hey, guys, thanks so much for watching today. We want to encourage you to go down and subscribe. Also, we want to ask you to prayerfully consider partnering with us to help us do whatever it takes to reach people far from God and to help them take their next step towards spiritual maturity. Listen, guys, once again, thanks for watching today. And you can find out more about SoulQuest Church at soulquestchurch.com.